Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be uh, to be here today with you, and uh, we pray that the Lord will uh, anoint the message. My wife says she's scared, so I don't know what about you is scaring my wife, but would you please stop it? <laughs> whatever, you're, whatever you're doing that's frightening my sweet wife. Um, Cal has been uh, ministering to us with the theme of spiritual formation, uh, talking about how uh, through God's Spirit working in our lives, we actually are being conformed to the image of Jesus. That's the whole purpose of our lives. God's number one goal for you and me is to be Christ-like, that we would be Christ-like. And that's my goal for myself, and I trust that's your goal for yourself. And spiritual formation is God's Spirit working in us, helping us to become more and more like Christ. Don't you wish the person next to you was more like Christ? I mean, just don't you wish they were more like Christ, more love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control? So we're going to talk about personal Bible and uh, prayer. Bible reading and prayer, family Bible reading and prayer. We're going to talk about the vital importance of personal time in the Word, personal time in prayer, family time in the Word. Um, over the last few years, my wife and I have gone two or three verses at a time from Genesis to, uh, to Revelation, and I go to my little corner and read the assigned passage, and then she goes to her corner and reads her assigned passage, the same passage, and then we come back later and share with each other what the Lord said to us out of the Word. Now, this year we've changed, and we're just kind of going through a speed read. You know, when they would read the word of the Lord to the people of Israel, they would all stand as the whole law was being read. So I'm going through the Bible for the second time this year. I listen to it and uh, go through it quite rapidly, half an hour a day, and I'm already back in 1 Samuel the second time through. But it, it's, uh, it's very interesting how different uh, this kind of Bible reading is for me as opposed to very, very small portions. You have to find your own rhythm, find your own way, but you do need to live in the Word of God. And my wife, since having COVID, has spent a whole lot of time in Psalms 119. Good morning. And I am scared. I don't know why you scare me. <laughs> okay, so um, there are, what, 176 verses in Psalm 118. So I've only chosen about 13, and we're going to go through them really quickly because Jerry has a really long sermon to Amen. preach. Okay, so we're going to start at verse 9. We're not even going to start at verse 1. But verse 9 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? And the answer is by living according to your word. Reading the Bible will keep you pure. Reading the Word every day will keep you pure, will help you to stay on the path. All right, next verse. Your statutes are my delight, and they are my counselors. I don't know how you read your Bible, but I always am delighted to read my Bible because I have a cup of coffee or at night a bowl of ice cream. <laughs> so delight means that it's something pleasing, and it's something enjoyable. If you're going to sit down and you're not in a happy mood, don't read your Bible because you won't enjoy it. But find that joy of reading your Bible. Okay, we're going to go quickly. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When you hide something, you hide it in your heart. Your heart in, uh, in Hebrew is the word lab. And it's the feelings, the will, and the intellect. It's the center of your being. And you, you hide in your heart. You put that verse in your heart, and you hide it there, and it's there when you need it. When you're, you know, doing something you wish you weren't doing, like we talked about in class today, like, well, I won't tell you. They, they already know my sins, so I won't tell you. Okay, shopping is one. Shopping chocolate is one. All right, so we're going to go on. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. So this is the idea. This is, this is really interesting in the Hebrew because this is like turn away my eyes from vanity. Turn away my eyes from beholding. You know, you look at something, you want it, but, then, but if you start to behold it, to, to uh, long for it, to joyfully look at it, to gaze at it, oh, dear. Maybe, oh, we're not supposed to do that, okay? Ah, let's go on. We have to do this quick. <clears throat> Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. This is verse 67, afflicted. This is an interesting word, ana in Hebrew. It's, afflicted doesn't mean to be sick, 
but it means to be depressed or it means you're just you abase yourself you put yourself down it, this word is it let me see I have some notes on this it causes discomfort it's a physical or an emotional affliction and it's actually sometimes is allowed by God um, and so, so it's weakened it weakens us it weakens us when I, I uh, had COVID Jerry we were supposed to do a mission tour in North Carolina and while we were driving there we were driving to North Carolina from Pennsylvania I was feeling tireder and tireder and I said Jerry I, I just can't go on and the next morning, he, he said, you going to go to church? And I said, I'm too tired. And I slept through the whole day. Well, then we did the COVID tests, and sure enough, I had COVID. So we um, ordered two, bedroom, two beds every night. You know, he slept in one, I slept in the other, six feet apart. And um, I didn't go to church. I didn't go with any people. He would bring me food. And every night, he'd walk out the door to go preach, and I would say, Lord, what am I going to do for three hours? Because sometimes he would have to drive for an hour, even an hour and a half. And, and I, would, I would say, okay. And it was like God said, read the word, Psalms 119. And I go, Lord, I was, I've been afflicted. And right there is the verse that tells me I've been afflicted. And, and I've been weakened. And, I've been, and I would just read Psalms 119. And I would just look up words. And I would just be so blessed. Um. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Now, is that true for all of you? Would you take a Bible instead of a thousand pieces of gold? We're really money crazy, aren't we? We're, all, we're so afraid of our finances. We're afraid of our, oh my goodness, we're all afraid the prices are going up, the gas is going up. And yet the word says we are to, we are to enjoy the war. We are to, we are to think the law, the Bible, is more important because of, the Lord's going to take care of us. Amen. Even Amen. if gas goes up to $10 a gallon. <laughs> all right. It's more important. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I have woken up many times at midnight, or not at midnight. I've woken up at night. And when I wake up at night, uh, I go, okay, Lord, here I am. I'm awake. I can't sleep. And I do two things. I either start reading the Bible or maybe a good devotional book. And often, I will get on my knees and pray for my kids. Often. Now, I pray for my kids. Jerry and I pray for our kids. We pray for our, our children. Ben, Kristen, ben, uh, Bill, Kristen, Ben, and Nate. Okay, I pray for them a lot. We pray for them a lot. But at midnight or during the night, if God wakes me up, I get on my knees and I pray for my kids. I don't know why. I don't even know what I'm praying for sometimes. I pray for my kids. So read the Bible. Read the Psalms. If you can't sleep, just start reading the Psalms, and you'll soon fall asleep. It's a great sleeping pill. Okay, so then, where, where are we now? If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. This is, I was studying this verse, and it's, it's kind of interesting, because it actually means if, you, if the law had not been your joy, and your, then I would have perished means you uh, actually, you, you wouldn't have escaped from something awful. Or you, would, you, would, you wouldn't have uh, fled from something horrible that was going to happen to you. By reading your Bible, you are going to stay away from some horrible thing. Now, this is what the Word tells us. Uh, how sweet are your words to my taste? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, I learned a long time ago, I guess, that when the uh, Hebrew scribes would would study the word, they would use honey to turn the parchment. They would use the honey, touch it, and then it, and then they would lick it. Okay, so the word is even sweeter than honey. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. The word is the lamp. It means that you glisten. That when you're walking in the dark and you, the lamp just guides you, it's glistening, and you can just follow it. You, don't, you won't go anyplace else because you see that lamp. It's, it's, it's not only lit, but it, it has a glisten to it. 
Direct my footsteps according to your word and let no sin rule over me. This means order my footsteps. Okay, so God, you can order. You can tell us where to go, when to go, what to do, what not to do. You, you, Jerry and I pray this all the time. We're doing something. Say, all right, let's pray. What should we do? We don't know what to do, God. What should we do? We pray this all the time, don't we? And God will order your steps and let no sin rule over me. You know, this word is the word dominion or mastery. Don't let any sin rule over you. Whatever it is, don't let it rule over you. Yes, you might feel it. You might be tempted by it. But don't let it run your life. All right, let's go on. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous laws. And those who love your instructions have great peace. They do not stumble. This is really important. Every day we should thank God for something. This says seven times. Seven times a day, I praise the Lord for your laws or for your family. Thank God seven times a day. And what will happen? It says you will have great peace. And you will not stumble. You will not fall. Thank you. So the whole Psalm 119 is talking about the beauty of God's Word, the power of God's Word, the importance of God's Word, the urgency of God's Word, the priority of God's Word. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to the village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, and she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord said, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha was distracted. This is a Bible study my wife did. Whenever you see me use a lot of Greek words, it's because my wife has done the research, and I just thank her. Distracted, peri spao. Peri, like, means around, and spao means to pull. So Martha is you and me when we're just pulling at all the things we have to do, and we're just going around in circles and pulling and pulling. Everyone stand up. Everyone stand up. Come on, wake up. This is a good break in the message. And just pull and go in a, in a circle. Pull and go in a circle. Pull and go in a circle. You, it's called the rat race. <laughs> Have a seat. So you've, you've been Martha. I've been Martha. She was very distracted. The word is also she was diakonian, which means deacon, which means that she was serving, waiting, acts of rendering friendly offices. So Martha is very busy in the, in the kitchen, very busy with her tasks and assignments. And what about Mary. Mary is wasting time doing nothing but sitting at the feet of Jesus. Parakathestesa is a Hebrew, uh, a, a Greek word. Kathesomai uh, is to seat myself. So she seats herself. It's something you have to do yourself. The, the, no one else sits you there. You, and para means near, and pros means very close. So the way the, the, the verb is written, it's double close, close and closer. Close. How close was she to Jesus? As close as you could be. And a aku, uh, akuan comes from akuo, which means she was listening, but it's not just like you hear a sound, but she was listening with understanding. So here she is, wasting time, doing nothing productive, nothing on the checklist was being checked off, no task was being fulfilled. She was doing literally nothing but sitting and soaking up the words of Jesus. In verse 42, Jesus says that there was one needful thing. Now, there's a whole lot of things we need to do. We have our checklist. We need to do this. We need to do that. All the things we need to do. And the Lord says, you know, the priority for you is to sit and listen to the Word of God. What would happen if we made, made that a priority in our lives? Before we do all of our checklists and all the things we have to do, by nature, I'm Martha, and my wife is Mary. She has helped me in our marriage to uh, prioritize our quiet time. If it was me, I'd get up in the morning, answer emails, prepare a sermon. Uh, go, you know, I'd be busy, busy doing God's work. God really needs me, and I'm so glad I'm available for God. But 
My wife just wastes an hour. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't read her emails. Doesn't. I mean, she just reads the Bible and sips her coffee, and you know, she doesn't do anything productive. What would happen if we could ask the Lord to help us to be a little bit less Martha? Someone has to fix the meal. Someone has to do the Martha things. That's sure. And Martha is a deacon. There's nothing wrong with being a deacon, serving. But the priority, the number one thing, the most important thing, the thing that was most needful, Jesus says, is to prioritize being at his feet. So we talked about the Word. Now let's talk a little bit about prayer. What does Jesus say about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount? When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by everyone. Truly, I tell you, they receive their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Your prayer time is your private time with the Lord. So why do we pray? Lucas told us this morning that we pray because we need to shift our desires so that they match up with God's desires. That's one of the two primary reasons we pray. We pray because it changes me. When I pray, it changes my priorities. When I pray, it aligns my desires with God's desires. And that's that's why we pray. We want God to change us. But we also pray because when we pray, we actually partner with God in a world where God honors human freedom. God doesn't kick you into the kingdom. God doesn't force you to live a holy life. God invites you. God calls you. But by grace, you are free to say yes or no. By grace, you're free to embrace or not what the Spirit is saying to you. So when we pray, we are actually partnering with God in a world where God honors human freedom. Let me give you some illustrations of this. The story of Elijah, the lonely, the lone ranger prophet. Elijah prayed after the 450 prophets of Baal had done their best to get fire to fall from heaven, to burn the sacrifice, and Baal did nothing. They cut themselves, they screamed, they yelled. Then Elijah said, okay, it's my turn. He prayed a short prayer. Oh, God, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make it known right now that you are God of Israel. Answer me, God, and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. Immediately, the fire of God fell, burned up the offering, the wood, the stone, the dirt, even the water in the trench. All the people saw it, and they fell on their faces in awed worship. And what did they say? God is the true God. God is the true God. 450 prophets of Baal against one prophet of God. It's not fair. Of course not, because all the odds were on Elijah. <laughs> he was praying to the true God, the living God. And the 450 were in trouble. So his obedience, God used that prayer to turn the tide of history. Uh, Ezekiel describes a city that was full of sin. It says that the, that the princes were multiplying widows. That means the businessmen were killing the men and stealing their property and multiplying. The prophets were prophesying falsehood, saying, Thus saith the Lord, and God hadn't said anything. And the priests were profaning sacred things as if they were common things. What terrible sinful city is Ezekiel talking about? The terrible, sinful city was Jerusalem, the holy city. And the Scripture says that God looked for someone to stand up for me against all of this sin in the city of Jerusalem to repair the defenses of the city, take a stand for me, and stand in the gap to protect this land so I wouldn't have to destroy it. And I couldn't find anyone. No one. How many people was God looking for in Jerusalem during that moment of history? 70, 40, 12, 3, Uno, your favorite card game. If God, your grandchild's favorite card game. If, if God had found even one person in Jerusalem available for God's agenda to stand in the gap, to pray, to be available, I think history would have been different. But God searched throughout that generation of Lantana, searched throughout that generation of the Metroplex, and couldn't find anyone available for God's agenda to pray God's prayers. Everybody was selfishly wrapped up with their own small, selfish lives. And the city finally imploded and was destroyed, I believe, for lack of one person who would pray, who would be available. We can make a difference. Our prayer life makes a difference. The most tragic scripture in the New Testament is found in Mark chapter 6. This is Jesus. He returned to his hometown, Nazareth. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting hall in the synagogue. He made a real hit. We had no idea he was this good. So the carpenter can preach. Oh, my goodness, the carpenter can preach. 
But in the very next breath, they were cutting him down. Yeah, but he's just a carpenter. He's Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what they knew about him. And the Bible says that Jesus couldn't do what Jesus wanted to do. Jesus is God in the flesh. But he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He couldn't do much of anything there. He did heal a few people, small, minor healings, I suppose. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. So uh, in Spanish, uh, what's the word for wife? Esposa. Uh, what's the word for handcuffs? Esposas. What, what were the Spaniards thinking when they, when they used the word esposa for a wife and put an S on the end, and that's handcuffs? I mean, my wife never limits me. She doesn't handcuff me. She sets me free. All men say amen. Um, do you ever handcuff God? When you're not available for God, when, when you're not partnering in your prayer, because your prayer releases God, but literally, God cannot do what God wants to do in my life unless I partner with God. He can't do in my family what God wants to do. He can't do in Lantana Church. When you pray for Pastor Cal, things happen in his life because it's not that, so, so why do I pray? Do I pray because God doesn't know who's sick and I have to tell God who's sick so God gets busy and helps him? Why do we pray? Oh, because God's not very nice. But the more I pray, the nicer he becomes? No, God is all-knowing and all-loving all the time, so why do we pray? Let's just go watch soap operas. We, we pray because, because literally God cannot invade my life, my family, my church, my world, unless someone says, yes, through me, I'm available, use me, my prayer, my availability, my obedience. In your family, someone can be used by God if they're available. For God. And Jesus couldn't do what he wanted to do in Nazareth because of the unbelief, the stubborn unbelief of the people there. And then compare that to the story of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus entered the village of Capernaum. A Roman captain came up in a panic and said, Master, here's a, here's a, here's a military man, a Roman military man talking to Jesus asking for healing for his servant, not for himself or his wife or children, for his servant. So here's this military guy, and he says, Jesus, he can't walk. My servant is in terrible pain. Jesus said, I'll come. I'll heal him. So I'm going to walk to his house. Oh, no, said the captain. I don't want to put you to all that trouble. Just give the order, and my servant will be fine. I'm a man who takes orders and gives orders. I say to one soldier, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. My servant, do this, and he does it. Taken aback, Jesus was amazed at the faith of this centurion. The same word in Greek, Jesus was amazed at the faith of the centurion, is Jesus was amazed at the resistant unbelief of the people in Nazareth. He was amazed. He was shocked. It actually broke his heart. He was amazed. I've, I've yet to come across this simple kind of trust in Israel. The very people who are supposed to know all about God and how he works. Jesus turned to the captain and he said, you know what? Go. What you believe could happen has happened. Now watch these next slides. I had fun, I had fun doing this. You ready? Here he is. Are you ready? Oh, long distance healing. Instantaneous long distance. Guess what? At that very moment, long distance, he was healed. So what happened? The partnership of that man's faith multiplied the miracle. If God has a miracle for you, do you want it microscopic and so small everyone debates whether it's a miracle or not? It's so small. No, it's not, no, it's not really a miracle. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Listen, if God has a miracle for me, I'll do a McDonald's. Supersize it, please. You go ahead. Supersize my miracle. If God has a miracle for you, your faith, your availability, your prayer releases God to do what only God can do. You can restrict God, or you can release God. You can, with your prayer and faith and obedience, say, go for it, God. Or you can say, no, not me, not now, not here. No, under, under certain circumstances, I might be willing to do something for you, Lord. So, by the grace of God, we multiply the miracle. So God used a lonely prophet. His prayer turned the tide of history. For lack of one person, Jerusalem was destroyed. Jesus couldn't do what he wanted to do because of the unbelief of the people in Nazareth, but he used the faith of a Roman soldier to do a majestic miracle. What about your prayer? We pray because we want our will to align to God's will, but we pray because literally we release God in our world or we restrict God in our world. 
So invest a few minutes every day. You can read the Bible while you're driving to work. My goodness, you have all that time you're killing. You can do your exercises with your exercise bike and hear the Bible being read. You can read the Bible. Take a few minutes. You brush your teeth every day. Come on, read a little bit of the Bible. You take a bath every day. Come, just take a little bit of time for some spiritual hygiene. We're grateful, of course, that you took a bath. And all you need to do to learn to pray is to pray. So I'm going to have you stand right now, and we're going to have a short concert of prayer before you go to lunch. You start prayer time with praise. You say, by praising God, well, we praise you, God, that that grass fire didn't reach the church. <laughs> praise God. So we praise God. We start by saying, so I want you to get in groups of three or four or five or however small, just turn around to the people behind you in front of you in small little groups and just pick one person in your group to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Someone in your group. Go ahead. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Um, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness endures, continues through all generations. So in your small group, just pick someone to pray a prayer of praise and gratitude and thanksgiving. praise you. We magnify your name. We exalt you. You're worthy of all praise. We start our prayer time by lifting your name and worshiping you, and we express our gratitude to you. Seven times a day, we bring our praise to you. Seven times a day, we say, thank you, Lord. We say our praise and our gratitude to you. Praise God. Praise God. Would you turn to the screen and read together with me the prayer the Lord taught us to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I want you just to, to, to pause where you are, and I want you to pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray for your nieces. Pray for your nephews. Lamentations 2.19, Arise, cry out in the night. As the watches of the night begin, pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children. So I know you're not very comfortable doing this, but go ahead and raise your hands. This is not a deodorant test. And I want you just right there where you are, I want you to pray for God to bless your children, to bless your grandchildren, your nieces and your nephews. Go ahead, just take a moment and just pray your prayer. You can pray out loud, you can pray silently, but just pray a prayer. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children. Now I'd like you to get back in your small group again, if you would, and I, I, I'm going to read from 1 Timothy. First of all, then, I urge you that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Everybody in Texas, everybody everywhere, this is good, and please is God our Savior. Why are we praying for everybody? Why are we praying for everybody? Why? Because God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's Paul writing to Timothy. So now in your small group, just uh, have one person pray. And, and pray for your family and your friends who are living in hell. They haven't died. 
They're alive, but they're living a real hell right now. Pray for God to rescue them. Pray for God to save them. Pray that God's love would be found in their lives. So pray, just have one person in your group pray for our family and friends in this small circle, family and friends who don't know the Lord, who need the Lord's grace in their lives. Pray, pray for those that are lost. pray for our family and our friends who need your grace in their lives today. We pray you would interrupt the hell that they live with your grace and love and forgiveness. Help us to be more loving. Help us to be more kind to our family and our friends that we might reflect Christ to them and that they might be hungry for you. We pray. Help us to be salt. Help us to be light. And then after you praise God and you worship God and you pray for your family you pray for the lost then then pray for your kidney and your liver and uh, pray, pray for your illnesses and your ingrown toenail whatever it is you need to pray about you need a job whatever it is whatever your needs are do not be anxious about anything Paul writes but in every situation by prayer and petition and thank with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ so now in your small group have someone in your group. Just select someone to pray for the special needs in your group. Physical, emotional, psychological, financial, family, whatever they are. But God is the God who knows our needs and meets our needs. So pray for God to answer our needs in our group today.